we are surprised, I am surprised, every time I see this gospel reading about the rich man and Lazarus because there is nothing at all said about their righteousness or their sinfulness, either one of them. All it is spoken of is their wealth on the one hand and their poverty on the other. Now we know that there is more to it than that, but the point is made very strongly as the Lord makes it himself on other occasions how difficult it is for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who has great wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And since that day, since the Lord spoke those words, since he gave this parable, we have sought to understand why this is the case. Is wealth evil? And the answer consistently is always no. There is nothing wrong with wealth by itself. The problem is how wealth, how plenty affects the soul of the human being. And you will see in the wisdom from the church fathers this week, there is an interpretation of this. St. Gregory of Nyssa clarifies. He says, the man who has once chosen pleasure in this life and has not cured his inconsiderateness by repentance, places the land of the good beyond his own reach. For he has dug against himself the yawning impassable abyss of a necessity that nothing can break through. And this is the problem with wealth. This is the problem with plenty. And this is a pressing concern for us who live in this country. Because here, even the poor are wealthy. They have the cable television, the cell phones, the internet. Very few are truly destitute. And even we, however meager we may consider our income, all of us have what have become to be, what have come to be considered essentials of life. We have, again, the TV. We have the internet. We have the nice furniture. We have the good clothes. And if we were to come to church without dressing and doing our hair in a specific and appropriate way, we will be condemned. Even that has become a necessity. We expect everyone who is decent and in order and respectable to dress with a certain degree of fineness. We have made these things necessary for ourselves. And having made them necessary, who among us can consider with equanimity, with ease, losing these luxuries? Even if we have a brief power outage, we resent not having the television. These luxuries have become necessities for us. I recall for myself, one evening, there was a tornado warning, and I have come to depend very much on my cell phone because I have all the information I might possibly need from it. And as I huddled in the closet under the mattress with Presitero and our children, I realized my phone's battery was dying, and I could not plug it in. I couldn't leave the closet. There might be a tornado. I might die. And I didn't have the news. I didn't know what was going on. I was bored. I was frustrated. And I was scared. Without any connection to the outside world, which I had become so accustomed to, that to be bereft of it was like losing a limb. We have the same experience, perhaps, if we go camping. If we drive somewhere where there is not a cell phone signal, we are angry that we can't call somebody. 
We think we deserve to have good cell service wherever we are, right? This is only to illustrate that St. Gregory's point is very true. What begins as a luxury, a pleasure that we receive with joy, as we are accustomed to it, it becomes a necessity. We cannot do without it, and we are angry when we lose it. And this is why it is difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Because when we are surrounded by plenty, we become addicted to it, and we seek greater and greater plenty, greater and greater pleasures, more and different entertainments, all to fill the yawning hole in our hearts that truly only Christ can fill. But we turn away from the gift of God. We abandon the simple blessings of repentance and humility, and we turn towards the things of this world and make them a necessity. And when finally they are taken from us, even if only at the hour of our death. We cannot expect our soul to let them go without the same anger and resentment that we feel when we can't get a cell phone signal, but ever so much more so. And how will it fare with us if we encounter the angels with a red face with anger in our voice that we are bereft of these pleasures of life. How will it fare with us when we come before the throne of Christ himself and we are thinking of the pleasures left behind on earth? This is the problem. We cannot experience plenty without gripping to it like a, like a drowning man clinging to a life preserver. But it is not life for us, this wealth, this plenty, this security that we have. It is death because it keeps us from the giver of life. Now, do I say to you today that to avoid this, we should give up all of our wealth and run into poverty? I sometimes think that we should not dismiss this option so quickly, but no, I do not tell you that you should do this. I mention this problem as it is highlighted in the gospel because it is because of this reality of our soul that we fast and we pray and we give alms in the way that we do. Because fasting loosens the grip of plenteous food on our heart. If we discipline ourselves to give up the rich the rich food on a regular basis, not only when we are preparing to receive communion, but every Wednesday and every Friday and during the other fasts of the church, then we understand that food will not bring us happiness. We experience hunger, and in hungering, we are blessed if we fast right to learn to hunger for righteousness. We give alms not because the poor need our money, but because we need to learn to give up what we would so often cling to and say is ours. The poor may or may not need our money, but we need to give it. Because clinging to it leaves our arms 
busy, occupied, so that they cannot receive the gift of God which surpasses wealth. And prayer. We pray so that all of our free time is not spent in seeking our own pleasure, so that we spend some time looking instead of at the things of this earth, we look instead to Christ. And instead of asking to receive what we want, we offer to him our repentance, our brokenness, and we ask only for mercy. Every one of these practices of the church is not a legalistic requirement. It is not an arbitrary discipline. It is a tool that allows us all of whom, all of us are wealthy, all of us are camels. These disciplines shrink us down. They make us small and weak so that we may pass through the eye of the needle and receive the salvation of God. This is ultimately what St. Paul hears, too, in the epistle. And forgive me, I know the sermon goes longer than it should. But St. Paul goes and he asks God for a blessing. He asks for further strength against whatever temptation assails him. And God says to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When we are strong, we do not need God. And he does not ask for our strength, but our weakness. Because in our moment of weakness, of hunger, of repentance, of giving of our own wealth to someone who may or may not need it, in those moments, we become weak and we may be made strong, not by our own will, but by the power of God, which is infinitely greater than our own strength. These readings, in short, speak of the very essence of our faith, of why we are who we are and do what we do. And I pray that we may hear and understand and walk in this way so that wealthy and blessed though we are, we may be counted with the poor man, Lazarus. That when we pass from this life, we may be embraced by Abraham as we wait for the resurrection and not be found with the rich man who could not let go of luxuries that had become necessities that we may be counted among the saved and may pass through the eye of the needle into the heavenly kingdom. Amen. This concludes the services for today. Again, please note the General Assembly next Sunday, the Spanakopita sale today, and the New Year's party on December 31st. God bless you all.